Welcome to session three. This is part one of uh, Word Pictures of Face. We uh, have spent the first two sessions on word studies and we've got a couple images of, of uh, faith. Uh, anybody, there's like three different things that we've uh, touched on and they're kind of main points. Does anyone uh, want to try and pick out some of the images of faith that we've uh, developed using the, the word studies? Does anyone care to venture? Uh, uh, there, there were two or three images of faith. Does anybody remember uh, what some of the images were. I'm getting a nursing, nurse, nur nursing mother, nursing, a, a parent, nurturing and embracing the child. Greek, from the Greek picture, what, what uh, image was that? The python. Okay, very good. We have the python wrapped around its prey, eventually ingesting it. So the image here is holding on while getting nourishment. Um, that picture sort of implies that uh, faith is kind of all about us and how 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 well we can hold on, how how strong, how tightly we can grasp. But that's kind of an incomplete picture. And, and the Hebrew, as uh, uh, Karen remembered, a parent holding a nursing child. So while we're being nourished, we are also being held or embraced. And so that tells us that faith, uh, God's active in our faith. He's supporting us while we believe, while we draw nourishment from him. Uh, the name of God that uh, uh, portrayed him as, uh, as one that can nourish many was El Shaddai, the Almighty, uh, which could also um, uh, create the image of the many-breasted one, if you will. And then uh, one that we just touched on towards the end of last time uh, was a passage from Exodus where Israel was battling Amalek. And uh, when Aaron and Hur held up Moses' arms, Israel prevailed. And then there was another, and uh, the word for faith, imuna, that word first shows up in that passage translated as steady, when Aaron and Hur held his arms steady, Israel prevailed. So the picture there is, by faith, we prevail over our enemy. But in the uh, uh, in Habakkuk 2.4, which I think it might be on the next slide, yes. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The word lifted up in Hebrew is afal. It's only used one other time in Scripture, and it's when Israel, again, tried to go up to battle against Amalek, but they did so presumptuously. God told them not to go. Moses told them not to go because they'd already uh, backed out. They didn't have the faith to enter the land with the giants, so they got all afraid, and Moses said, uh, the Lord said through Moses, you're in the wilderness for a while, none of you are going to enter in. Uh, your carcasses will die in the wilderness, and I'll take your children in. They said, "Oh, we don't want to do that. We like Plan A, so we're going to try and take the land." So they went up against the Amalekites, and they got throttled. So when they went out in pride, they lost against their enemy. Faith, you win. Pride, you lose. Habakkuk contrasts those who live by pride versus those who live by faith, and pride. And faith war against one another. Pride is about what I can do. Faith is about what God can do. Pride can be what I can't do if we look to ourselves and our own abilities or inabilities. Our, our focus is wrong. We need to look to what God can do through us, with us. Now we're going to break into some ground I think most of you are probably familiar with word studies. Now we're going to kind of get into some new territory uh, with word pictures. Again, this is possible because uh, the Hebrew characters are, have a pictographic character to them. 
So these Hebrew word pictures, they're not only going to teach us more about faith, but they're going to lead us to scriptures in which the war between pride and faith climaxes during the tribulation. So we're, we're going to get a little uh, hint at uh, some prophecy uh, just within the structure of the word faith. But before we can do that, we got to lay a little groundwork. Again, the word studies are tools. The word pictures are, are tools. The word pictures were developed using word studies. During the days of Moses, Hebrew was in a cultural transition from a pictographic language to one that is more phonetic. Greek is a purely phonetic language. Ours is purely a phonetic language. Our letter B uh, has nothing at all to do with uh, the, the buzzy little thing that goes from flower to flower or the state of being verb uh, to be. It's letter B because it makes the B sound. That's not the case with, with Hebrew, especially the ancient Hebrew. In the, your lexicon, uh, sometimes you'll look up a root word and you'll see a little abbreviation P-R-I-M uh, period. That means it's a, it's a primitive root, so uh, it's not a word that's derived from any other word in the, in the Hebrew language. It's, it, it's, it's a fundamental root, so it's, it's a basic concept. The, the picture for these primitive roots is usually more easily seen uh, in ancient Hebrew characters than the modern square letters that have their origins in the Babylonian culture. We have uh, Aleph. First letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. This is the, the Babylonian square letter, if you will. This is the, the, the modern Hebrew font. And <clears throat> this is the ancient Hebrew character. Its ancient character depicted the head of the ox. So you've got, uh, uh, I guess these would be the ears, and there's, here's the horns, and this is the, the face of the ox. Now if you trim the ears and you... Uh, rotate that about 270 degrees, you get our modern letter A. So you can see where we get our uppercase A from uh, the, the form of the ancient Hebrew letter. But it, it's, it's a picture of an ox. In Hebrew, Aleph, that's the name of the letter. Uh, it, it also uh, can be spelled Aluf. Fav is a vowel letter. As Hebrew uh, progressed and, and developed as a language, uh, this is called a, a full spelling. This is a de defective spelling. So uh, most of your Hebrew words are, are three, three letters, three characters. Uh, but as the, the vocabulary of the language expanded, they needed to be uh, more, more clear. And so uh, uh, vowel letters were, were incorporated. Most of the, the Hebrew words, the, the vowels were implied, and then they de developed a system of, of vowel points. Well, Aleph, if you look it up in the, in the lexicon, you can see a, a whole list of words for Aleph and, and Aluf. Uh, it can mean ox, but the word can also denote a strong leader in the uh, Israeli army. Uh, a lieutenant uh, it has a rank of Aleph, so he, he's a leader. And I, I even think the, uh, the, the British term lieutenant might even be a, a derivative of this. Uh, as a verb, it can mean to teach, uh, or to be gentle or, or tame. These are qualities of a, a domesticated ox. Uh, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, he's referring to uh, a, a situation where you take an experienced ox and then there was a special yoke that was created, and you would yoke an inexperienced ox to the more experienced one, and as long as the inexperienced ox stayed on track with experienced one, the yoke was easy, no problem. But if he's tried to wander to the right or the left or to slow down or to speed up, the yoke would chafe on the, the young ox and he'd say, oh, that hurts. I better not do that. So when Jesus says, uh, you know, take my yoke upon you, it's that type of training yoke where if we walk alongside him, we go where he goes. Life's going to be pretty good for us. But if we try and, and err and deviate, it, it's going to chafe and we're going to find discomfort. So that's all F. Second letter is Beth. Again, there's the uh, Aramaic square letter up there in the, in the upper left-hand corner. And this is the, uh, the ancient character. And 
Uh, Beth is uh, it depicts a house. So you got your your roof. Uh, I don't know if this is maybe the the pathway up to the house. And again, if you uh, kind of rotate this and straighten this out, you can get see where we get the the lowercase b. So Beth may describe a house or a household. Just the single letter um, in in Hebrew can be used as a prefix. So in Hebrew, they they uh, can use a single letter for for a prefix. And so it could be in, and the, the word Beth can mean this also, in, within, or the inner part. So it's kind of, you know, like in the house. So those are some of the literal meanings of the word. All right, so let's uh, put them together and let's make, let's make a word. Again, Hebrew reads from right to left. So this is the first letter, Aleph, second letter is Beth, and it's uh, the Hebrew word for father, which is a primitive root. Now from the picture, we can see that the father is a combination of two pictures. He's the leader of the house. Remember, Aleph could mean leader, and house means house, leader of the house. So this isn't rocket science. But you can also find the character of a father. Remember the ox, the train, a gentle teacher, gentle, tame. So he's a gentle teacher of the household. Using the notion of in or within from Beth, and the notion of strength, the Father is our strength within. Ooh, now we're getting spiritual. Our Heavenly Father is our inner strength. And the Father, he worked with the flocks and the herds and took care of the house. So there's uh, just uh, uh, some high-level things. Uh, I, I actually did a detailed study of this, and it was like 12 pages. It would take us uh, you know, five or six hours to go through all the things that it, it shows. But... Just, uh, just to get a, a flavor of this, so you get the idea of how, how the pictures work. You, you just, you can combine the, the two symbols together, uh, and, and they give you images. Well, now there's another type of word picture. It, it was great fun working on, on some of this. It's, it's sort of like doing a puzzle. Some words contain a, a phonetic component, for lack of a better term. Essentially, think of it as, as a complete but shorter word. So you have a word with some number of letters in it. You might be able to break that up into a word and a picture or a couple small words plus a picture or a word and, and several pictures. Karen is a word meaning horn. The 17th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is pe, and it pictures a mouth, especially the face. And I think you can sort of see that. You've got uh, sort of looks like a little Pac-Man there almost. Uh, that's the letter pay. At the end of a word, pay is one of the letters where it, it, it changes the shape. And that's, they would use that. They didn't always have spaces uh, in, in some of the ancient texts because it was uh, the writing, not paper, but uh, leather, or what, whatever writing surface they had, it was, it was very precious and expensive. So they would try and jam this stuff together. So by... Uh, uh, changing the shape of some of the letters at the end of the word, it, it helped to uh, parse the text uh, without having to, to use the space. So it was a, a space-saving device. So when, when you combine a horn and a mouth, you get a rhinoceros. Now rhinoceros from uh, uh, Greek, rhino is nose and charos is, is horn. In Hebrew, the horn Karen is the phonetic component. You combine that with the picture of a face, and you get the uh, Hebrew word kernof, which is a rhinoceros. That's a, that's a modern word that shows the combination of a shorter word and a picture. That uh, makes sense? Okay, now we're going to start... Uh, having a little fun with word pictures in, in faith, uh, but I'm going to have to introduce you to uh, to the different letters. So faith, uh, again, Amuna or the the fuller spelling with the letter Fog in there, uh, both different ways of writing faith, and faith is derived from um, uh, the root verb Amen, which is is to believe. And you can see that the root verb is, is right in here. So uh, again, this, this letter is another one that changes shape at the end of the word. So amen 
you've got amen in here with a with a final vowel, uh, and here you've you've got amen, but uh, a vowel is inserted with the vowel at the end. The individual letters, uh, my book Messages from God. Uh, that's sort of my operating lexicon right now for the individual letters. We're going to look at the five letters that we will encounter in the various forms of the word for faith. So these five letters, we're going to take them one at a time. Aleph, again, uh, pictured the head of an ox in its ancient form. I gave you some of the uh, literal interpretations. Now, from uh, the work that the word studies I did in my book, th here's sort of the the capsule summary, high-level summary for this letter. Aleph represents Jesus Christ. So these highlighted words here are, are sort of the, the, the key concepts. Jesus Christ in his first advent as a sacrifice. Okay, Aleph is translated as ox once in uh, the Old Testament. And it's in, in Jeremiah where it says, I was like a sheep or an ox led to the slaughter. That's the only time that word is translated. It's, it's speaking of Christ and his crucifixion. In his second advent, which comes out of the Aramaic, he, it's, uh, he's more, uh, Aleph depicts more of a ruler. When scripture uses Aleph to denote ruler or governor, it's specifically a governor Judah. What tribe did Jesus come from? Judah. Gee, what a coincidence. Those, those two uh, concepts there, we've, we've learned that Jesus is going to be a sacrifice, and we've learned that he's going to come from Judah. First letter, numerical value one, preeminence. God is the preeminent being. Also, some, I've noticed on some of the letters there's sort of a darker side, if you will, original sin. Well, Jesus bore our sin to the cross. When he went to the cross, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances against us. God's preeminence, original sin, he, he's a, a ruler, he's our sacrifice, and that's uh, some of the high-level uh, uh, significances for uh, Aleph. Mem. Mem depicted water or waves in its ancient form. So... You, you sort of see that. It's kind of like the, the edge of a pond, and you got these, these high waves uh, uh, thrashing about there. And you see if you uh, cut the, the bottom of the pond off here and invert this, you have our letter M. So we get our letter M, which makes the M sound just like the Hebrew word Mem makes the M sound. But he, ours is just a sound. Hebrew is a picture. Symbolically, Mem shows how and why God will save his elect and judge rebellious people. When used as a prefix, mem is an interrogative prefix. It's a question word. How? Why? Okay, so it, that's it. That, so that ties in with its grammatical use usage. What is what is man? Ma. Through Christ's death and resurrection and the Spirit's influence. Okay, water and the Spirit, I think uh, you're probably uh, mo most of you are familiar with the idea of the Holy Spirit and water being uh, um, some symbols uh, in Scripture. Deliverance. God will graciously deliver Jews and Christians from chaos, churning waves, chaos, but deliverance. Mem has a numerical value of 40. Again, uh, Hebrew, every letter uh, is also a number. Mem is, is 40. And from that idea, we get the notion of probationary trials. 40 days, 40 nights, 40 years in the wilderness. So you can do a word study on the number 40. If you do a word study on the number 40, you get this idea of, of probationary trials. Times of blessing, times of chastening, and the purpose is for uh, spiritual growth. So those are the key concepts with, with Mem. The letter Nun is a fish. So those are the Babylonian square letters up there. Here are uh, a couple different forms of the ancient letter. Uh, ignore that. That's just my uh, lack of skill with the, the software. Uh, trying to cover up a mistake and I didn't, didn't do so well. 
Noon is the image of a sprouting seed. Okay, this, this picture here on the left is the sprouting seed or a swimming fish. This letter symbolizes Jesus, the Son of Man. Th this uh, noon shows up oh, 30 plus times in the Old Testament and all but one or two of those cases is in the phrase Joshua the son of Nun. Joshua is the Hebrew way of saying Jesus which is the the, the Greek form. The idea of progeny is, is the son so it's Jesus the the son, Jesus the son of man. What did Joshua do? Well he let, he's gonna give spiritual progeny victory uh, over the flesh uh, for Israel, when Jesus returns, just like Joshua brought the nation of Israel into the Promised Land, when Jesus returns, he's going to bring Israel into all of its inheritance. If you look at uh, what God uh, said that Israel would inherit in the Old Testament, their that way's east. Their eastern border goes all the way to the uh, Euphrates River and their western border is going to go all the way to the Nile. So when they talk about the West Bank, they're, they're talking about the West Bank of the wrong river right now. <laughs> Fav. Fav is a hook or a nail. That's what the picture depicts. So both the modern and ancient forms kind of indicate that. And uh, Fav is a, uh, its grammatical function is a conjunction. What does conjunction do? It joins things together. What do you do with a nail? You, you nail two boards together. You hook two things together. Okay, so the picture and its grammatical function, uh, they, they match. Uh, if you study the letter Fav, uh, where it shows up, it shows up 13 times in the Old Testament. And it's all, I think, almost every occurrence, it's uh, the hooks that held the screens together in the tabernacle. Some were in the, the holy place, some were in the most holy place, some were silver, some were gold. But the hooks are holding things together. The, this picture, you, its numerical value is six. Six, you hear people say it's, it's man's number. Well, that's only half the story. And actually, they're all God's numbers. Yes, six does uh, uh, concern man, but it's the atone, it's man's rebelliousness that it, it captures. And if you do the complete study on that, it shows the atonement for man's rebellion. So where grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more, if you will. The letter He, this is sort of like our letter E. Again, you have to rotate it uh, around. Uh, so it has a vowel sound. Uh, and if you... Uh, change some of the letters around, you can also get to the letter H. It does make a uh, kind of an H sound when it starts a, a word, uh, and at the end of a word it tends to have more of a, uh, a vowel sound to it, an, an A or an A. Numerical value of five, this letter symbolizes grace. The Trinity's indwelling, one, two, three, the arrows of the Almighty, changes hearts so that God can restore what sin destroyed. So this, this is a very, you, you've got uh, uh, a very strong picture there of what grace is. It's, it's, it's God piercing us uh, with uh, himself. He's, he's filling us. He's influencing us. Okay, so now we've, we've met the characters. Let's talk about these individual characters in the letter, in, in the word Imuna for faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, one of the aspects of faith is the substance of things hoped for. So let's take a look at the substance of faith, what things are hoped for. So, well, oxen from Aleph and fish from the letter Nun, you get protein from meat, and you can get clothing, shelter, tools, and adornments from the skin and bones. From the letter noon, seed, grain, fruits, vegetables, and progeny or children. Those are just the, the physical manifestations of uh, from the letter noon. Water, 
we know everybody needs water. That's certainly essential. You need water for people. You need water for animals. You need water for your crops. Nails or hooks, well, you got to hold the buildings, fences, clothing together. Things got to be held together. Otherwise, your house doesn't stand up. Your fence doesn't stand up. Windows or lattices for ventilation and security. So they didn't have glass windows, but it gets hot in the Middle East. So you'd have vents to uh, allow the air to move through. Uh, but you can also look through uh, the hole in the door, see who's coming. And so the modern letter actually does kind of a nice job of that. You got the roof of the house and you got a little peephole uh, right through the door so you can look out and see who's, who's coming there. Jesus chastened people of little feet faith for worrying about these things. So let's take a look at Matthew 6.25 and following. So I've, I've highlighted uh, some of the themes that uh, we got from the individual letters. So this is all about physical stuff. Jesus speaking here, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink. Okay, we had the, the meat, we had the water, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body, raiment, clothing? Then again, the hides off of the uh, the ox or, or the, the skins off the fish. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, they don't plant seeds. God does it for them. Neither do they they reap nor gather it into barns. You, those are the houses that are held together by the nails and the hooks. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature, and why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Well, they grow from seed, don't they? No, that, that's, a, that's a parenthetical insert. That's not in the original scripture. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today and tomorrow is, cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So again, he's addressing the faith of the people, and uh, they don't have much. And he's saying, look at all these things that are embedded in the word faith that you should be trusting me for. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles think. But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Again, without faith it is impossible to please God. A ju the just shall live by his faith. So if we have faith in God, the implication is he's going to provide these things. Now he didn't say it's going to be easy, and he didn't say that you're going to be, uh, you always have the jacuzzi suite at the, at the Marriott or something. If you, if you travel, you, know, you might have to stay in a youth hostel or, or a tent or something like that. Uh, uh, you might have hum, humble circumstances, but he's going he's gonna to cover. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Scriptural precedents for the pictures that we saw in, in faith. Any questions before we move on to uh, the next? Okay. The other thing from Hebrews 11.1, faith is also the evidence of things not seen. So let's take a look at some of the, the spiritual elements. Okay, we went through the, the list of the letters and we saw their, uh, their physical manifestations and their spiritual. So now let's, uh, with uh, this bit of scripture in mind, let's see now what God has provided spiritually for us. Okay, Jesus, the Son of Man, from Aleph and from uh, Nun, well, he was the sacrifice that washed away our sins. Okay, actually, that probably should the sacrifice should probably been uh, color coded green with Aleph because that was the sacrifice. But he washed away, got the water, washed away our sins by making atonement for our rebellion. Letter five, by his grace, he changes our hearts. To agree, that's the root verb, amen, with God, so that we can be saved. By grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus died for the sins of the world, but all are not saved. 
Why is that? Because the change of heart is missing. God's grace has to take action on our heart. We have to agree with him that we are sinners and that we are in need of a Savior, and then he will deliver us. If we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believers experience probationary trials to strengthen their faith in God so that they become spiritually mature and complete. You can look at the first four verses of James, where it tells us to count it all joy when things go south, because it's working patience within us. This is because when we believe, so we have this color-coded word for believe now, amen, Jesus, at the beginning and the end, surrounds us in the midst of our trial, as shown in the word picture. So if we believe and we were in a trial, Jesus is on both sides of us. He's, he's got us covered. In other words, he will never leave us nor forsake us in the midst of a trial. Hebrews 13.5. Now let's look at um, some of the word pictures just in the word uh, to believe, the root word for faith. Here's where we start getting into some of the prophetic elements. Some word pictures in Amen, the root word for faith, has prophetic implications. Let's consider that uh, the last letter of the word Amen, better known, depicted the idea of a fish or a seed. The Hebrew word for mother is Am. So in Amen, Amen, I was able to color code the English as well, you've got a picture of the seed of the woman. Again, Am is, is mother, which is one of the earliest prophecies about Jesus in, in Scripture. The picture makes sense, so you got mother and her seed, seed of the woman. Register with everybody? Mary Ellen, you look confused. You, you, you tracking with that? So a mother's a woman, right? Okay, so you got the mother and her seed, or the seed of the woman. Okay? So prophecy about Jesus. See what it says in that passage. Genesis 3.13 And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is that that thou hast done? They had eaten the forbidden fruit. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, now remember we talked about this, this war between faith and pride. And Lucifer was the first one to fall to pride. And we talked about that a, last time or the time before in Isaiah 14. So pride got the, the best uh, of Lucifer and he fell. So there's en enmity, here's the war, between thee, Satan, the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a prophecy about the crucifixion. Uh, that's the bruising of the, the heel of the seed of the woman. And uh, he's going to bruise thy head when Jesus returns. Uh, actually, he will... Uh, actually behead the uh, the Antichrist. He will discover the foundation under the neck, uh, is the way it reads in the King James and, and Habakkuk. So you've got the seed of the woman, but there's also a seed of Satan involved there, too. Okay, Scripture refers to Jesus as the Amen. So the seed of the woman is also the Amen. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, Right, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And we talked about the Amen, because uh, when we looked up uh, uh, the, the meaning of the word, we saw uh, the Amen as first translated as being the nursing father. Uh, I believe it was in Numbers, but I, I could be mistaken on that. And what was the Amen to do? He was to bring the children of Israel into their land. That was the responsibility, and Moses saying, I'm not up for this job. So we cannot ignore the seed of Satan, which will be a beast, again, Aleph, 
is, a, is an ox or a, a beast, that's going to emerge from the, the chaotic sea, those waves. So we have the first letter, a beast, the chaotic sea. That's the second letter of Amen. But whom the Amen will overthrow. The seed of Satan, beast out of the chaotic seed, and there is his seed. Revelation 13 describes him. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. The seed of the woman, and it also captures the, uh, the seed of Satan. So the, this word for belief, it's, got, it, it's capturing both sides of this. But fortunately, faith is discerning. Though not used in scripture, the Hebrew word moon is in the Hebrew vocabulary. So it's, it's in the lexicon. Mine has a little mark by it saying this is the Hebrew word, but scripture doesn't use it. But it means to bear an appearance to or to pretend. It is akin to the Arabic word meaning to lie or to speak falsehood. Okay, so this... This set of characters is right in the middle of uh, the, the Hebrew word imuna. We'll show that. So we got faith. I've, I've color-coded. So same, same five letters we've been looking at all along. I've just color-coded them differently now. Faith contains a warning to watch. Okay, we got our window, right? Look, look through the window, see who's coming. Depicted by the letter He, the last letter. Watch out for false or pretend messiahs. Jesus, in his first advent, was the messiah. If we are people of faith, we need to be discerning. we got to watch out for someone that's pretending to be the truth. Jesus told his disciples that in Matthew 24 and other places. Therefore, living by faith includes watching for false teachers. Make sense? Well, this, this is where we're really fleshing out what, what faith is. So we've already seen the, the physical, the spiritual. Faith is about prophecy. Jesus is coming back. Uh, Pastor Ray's been talking about that, uh, you know, really emphasizing that last couple of services. Jesus is coming. It's getting kind of exciting. Israel just had a uh, major oil discovery in the Golan Heights. That area is contested with Syria, where uh, Vladimir Putin has 150,000 troops. So we, we could be staging up the Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion uh, right now. It, it, it's getting, uh, could get really interesting. But this, this major oil, uh, it, it's supposed to be 10 or 100 times bigger than anything else in the Middle East. This is like a huge, this is a huge find. They, they, they're not going to know for sure until they flesh out how many layers, how deep it is, but it's, uh, it, it's substantial. This will be a game changer because uh, Israel has relied on us for a lot of money, but now that we've turned their back on them, God's decided to turn on the spigot and uh, uh, provide them oil revenue. Vladimir Putin is actively pursuing friendships since there's the, Obama has created a power vacuum uh, by pulling out of the Middle East. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum and Putin is going in there and he's trying to secure up all the the oil producing countries he already controls all the natural gas flowing to Europe he gets a monopoly on all the uh, uh, the fossil fuels uh, and it is, he, I think it's Ezekiel says the and the images from Western leaders what are you doing going in and the, he's going in to take a spoil and if Putin moved in on Israel, what would Obama do? He'd say, what are you doing? He was not going to do anything for the first president in, since Israel's been a nation. We've never had uh, a leader that has abdicated his responsibility uh, so consistently. And so it's exciting because uh, we, 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 we could be out of here soon. We might not make your, your event in two weeks. If, 
who knows? I, I, I can't. I, the, 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 the political wheels churn very slowly. Israel could never let Russia go in there. Well, um, God's not going to let Russia go in there. Uh, Ezekiel tells us the outcome. Uh, Russia is going to lose 80 to 85 percent of all its uh, armaments. Uh, they're going to get their clocks clean, and Israel's not going to find a shot, fire a shot. Um, God's going to intervene. So, but this is a key. This is a key turning point. I digress. So, watching out for false teachers. It, it's it's prophecy. Jesus warned a false Christ. Luke 21, 8, he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draws near, go you not after them. Another aside, the little church across the street that just moved in, um, if we, uh, we look them up on the internet and supposedly Jesus has come back and he's a pastor of uh, some church in Korea running, running things, and, and that's what they're... Uh, and, so they, they think that Jesus has already come back. And uh, if it's the same one, we, we, we Googled the name and, and we did some reading on it. I, it's an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. We've heard that too. But uh, they, they've got some really uh, far out uh, doctrine, if that is in fact uh, the, the same organization. And I don't know that 100% uh, sure, but if you Google the, the Mission of God Church or whatever they call themselves, um, you, you end up with a with a cult uh, that uh, has uh, uh, the Messiah as a pastor somewhere in, in South Korea. Peter warned of false teachers also, Second Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall privily bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Okay, another picture in the word faith. Joint heirs with Christ. This is the, we'll look at the defective spelling of uh, so imuna without the uh, the extra vowel letter in there. So that that word is also translated faith. The last three letters uh, can denote a portion of something. The first occurrence of this word uh, mana uh, denotes the part or portion of the breast of a lamb that Aaron used as a wave offering before the Lord in Exodus 29. Such portions of offerings were God's way of providing for the needs of priests and their families who served him on a full-time basis. The word picture points to our portion that we can have on the Lord as our heritage as joint heirs with Christ. So we have our portion in Christ. So Christ is our portion. So we are joint heirs with him. And Psalm 16 verses 5 and 6. The Lord, Jesus is, is the Lord, is the portion, there's a, where uh, Manoah is actually used in the scripture, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot, the lines are fallen to me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage. Isn't that cool? The Lord is our portion. When we have faith in him, that comes along, that's in the package too. Romans 8, 16, and 17, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So it does mention something about suffering with him. The fellowship of his sufferings in Philippians chapter 3. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, we, we talked about probationary trials. Paul lost everything, but he wasn't bothered by that. He, he counts that all but dung. Once we realize that we're joint heirs with Christ, what's all this stuff around us? 
what good is it going to do when when they put us in the ground you you, you know you can't take a u-haul with you to heaven you know the pot pot car doesn't go that far right <laughs> And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. Through faith, we count all those other things loss. Yeah, we still need to eat. We need a place to sleep. We need clothes. He knows we have need of those things. And he said he'll, he'll take care of those things. You know, we, we need to be diligent. We need to be good stewards. But... It's it's there if we uh, if we look for it, you know the the people with manna he didn't drop the manna in their tents they had to go out and and harvest it that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead so resurrection from the dead that's that's the hope that we have so we're we're flying through it this evening so here's Here's a recap of uh, some of the key points from, from this evening. So we have Jesus, the Amen, only appears in a letter that represents the final age of the church, Laodicea. Prophetically, Laodicea represents uh, the 20th century church. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, I think it started in Germany, but you started, uh, people started questioning the validity of Scripture and uh, the so-called higher criticism and you know they started reviewing the books and deciding that this prophet really didn't write that and that prophet didn't write that and Jesus didn't really say this there was some society that uh, they held a conference and they voted on what they thought was scriptural and the only uh, verse of what Jesus actually said that everybody could agree upon was it's more blessed to give than to receive so that they could keep their funds coming in Everything else, they, they voted out the whole whole New Testament, but uh, uh, they're in for a surprise. To believe, in the verb to believe, we saw Jesus surrounding believers in the midst of tribulation, providing food, clothes, shelter. Just a note, more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than at all of prior church history. The 21st century has started with open season on Christians worldwide. Uh, there's just all-out genocide in the Middle East. Uh, the shooting in Roseburg that just happened recently, uh, he had the, the kids stand up in class if, and ask them their religion. If they were Christians, they shot him in the head. If they weren't Christians, he shot him in the leg or something. But he killed the Christians instantly. Our president, he's inviting tens of thousands of Syrian refugees, but if he finds any Christians in the, in the bunch, he sends them back. He deports them back, but he keeps all the Muslims. Could get messy before we're taken out. I, I would love to just shoot out of here uh, before things get too bad, but uh, uh, I just don't see God working that way. I hope he does. I hope we're wrong on that, but uh, oh, we might have some tough sledding ahead. Besides the seed of the woman, which uh, again was uh, in this uh, form of, of amen, uh, Am, the mother, and Nun, the seed, we also saw a warning to people of faith about watching for false Christ, who is the seed of Satan, the beast that will emerge from the chaotic sea of the nations. And that's just part one. We've, we've only... We're, we're going to spend uh, in, in two weeks uh, at the Agape Hall at uh, Koinonia. Uh, we'll look at part two of this. Uh, again, there'll be a brief review. We're going to look at a different way of uh, looking at, at uh, the same letters, different uh, concept of, of parsing the different characters. And <clears throat> we're going to see even more uh, things embedded in the, in the word for faith. So I think that is all I have. Ah, one, one last thing. Overcomers with faith will endure suffering to become joint heirs with Christ. Revelation 3.21 So it's, to he who overcomes will I grant to sit at my right hand or to enter into my kingdom. You can't overcome unless there's something to overcome. So there's going to be opposition. We're going to face opposition. 
in, in these lives. Right now, uh, <clears throat> we're not really being persecuted, we're, we're being pressured. Um, but uh, persecution might not be uh, too far behind. That's all I have for this evening. Are there any general questions uh, about the material we covered? Just a comment, isn't it first that says, um, and this is what overcomes the world? Because... Yeah. That's right. Our, our faith overcomes the world. So faith is powerful, but when you, you say amen at the end of your prayer, it, it's not uh, it's not ten for good buddy. I'm all done. It, it, it's saying I, I believe that you've heard my prayer. I believe you have the power to answer my prayer, and I believe that you're going to act in in my best interest. I mean, and that's that's with the long game. Short term, it might not seem like he's acting in our best. <laughs> interests. Uh, I'm getting to the end of Habakkuk right now and you know he he sees that uh, the fig tree is not going to produce and the, the vines are going to be empty and the stalls are going to be empty, the flocks and the herds uh, there, there's nothing there because the enemy's coming but he says yet I will rejoice because he realizes, as did Paul, that all these things are, are really but, but dung. Um, Job, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Yeah, we might go through a hard time, but if he didn't, if he didn't take, send them into captivity, uh, they would have endured something much worse because there were plagues, there were other... Uh, uh, battles and wars going on. The ones that were carried away to Babylon, they were kept safe. And then when the time of, of uh, judgment and chastening is over, then they had their opportunity to return. But for the ones that stayed behind, it was a miserable, miserable life. So he did it to protect them, even though it uprooted them from their home, it uprooted them from their family. Uh, it, was, it was a hard thing. It was not pleasant. They, they were forced marched to, to Babylon. I've read some of the history on that. Nebuchadnezzar said, don't let them stop because they might pray. He, Nebuchadnezzar knew what had happened to uh, uh, Sennacherib, the Assyrians, when they, they, they came down and you know, they lost 170-some thousand soldiers in one night due to an angel coming through and, and, and whooping on them. And that, that historical event made Nebuchadnezzar very reluctant to uh, come after Israel. But uh, finally, uh, uh, he, he, he bit the bullet and, and went. But he said, don't let them stop and pray. They might repent. And he didn't want their God coming down on them. So he still had a fear uh, of God. So it might get ugly, but... In the end, we win. In the end, we're joint heirs. And so you gotta got to have an eye towards the long game and fasten your seatbelts. Could be a bumpy ride. I, I didn't really want to end on a downer, but <laughs> I better keep quiet before I make it worse. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, let's pray and we'll, we'll close. Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in you. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We see more than ever that we wrestle against principalities and power of darkness in high places. There's no doubt about that. They're getting more brash, more brazen. But Lord, we thank you that you are our hope. You will take care of us. And at the very worst, we die and get to be with you. So Lord... Uh, Help us to run the race as seeking the prize. Redeem the time in these evil days. But uh, above all, uh, trust in you and have faith in what you can do, Lord. Not look to our own limitations. Thank you for your great salvation and your love. And that even in the midst of the trial... You were there with us, and you will not leave us nor forsake us. 
Help us to hear your voice always. In Jesus' name, amen.